That's great. Thanks very much, Alana. And it's fantastic to be here beaming in virtually. Um, so I, just by way of background, um, and I'll get to some slides in a minute, but I should say a little bit about who I am and um, what I'm going to be talking about. So I'm here, I'm uh, the Associate Dean for Student Success in the College of Global Futures at Arizona State University, which is actually a pretty new college. We launched less than a year ago um, and is really focused on a very interdisciplinary approach to how we think about building better futures. Um, but for my own work, um, I work for any extensive across many, many different disciplines on um, responsible and ethical innovation and asking big questions around how do we ensure that new technologies actually serve society and serve us rather than cause more problems um, than they're worth. Um, and I should say, just for the record, I actually started life as a physicist, but I have worked across so many disciplines now, I have no idea what I am. I'm just confused. Um, so with that, um, I actually want to start off by going to a little over three years ago, and Alana will be familiar with this because she was in this inaugural, inaugural class. Three years ago, I taught a class for the first time called The Moviegoer's Guide to the Future. Um, I'm not sure I ever told you this, Alana, but actually the proper title for the class should have been, if you'll um, forgive the expression, um, The Moviegoer's Guide to Not Effing Up the Future. Um, but I was told by ASU, not that expletives weren't allowed, but the title was just too long to put in the catalogue, so it ended up as the movie goer's guide to the future. Um, and it was a uh, uh, course, we're still teaching it, um, that used um, sci-fi movies to try and get a good sense of how to think about um, socially responsible and ethical innovation. But it was also a course that built on many, many years of, of work um, and actually a book that was associated with it, which is the, the, the book that I want to be talking about at least a little bit today, Films from the Future, The Technology and Morality of Sci-Fi Movies. Um, and I don't know whether you remember, Alana, um, when I first taught that course, you actually had drafts of the chapters of the book. We didn't actually have the book to work from um, then. So this was also a process of putting the final touches on the book. Um, but for this talk, it, it's always a little bit difficult to know how to structure this talk, because if I'm talking to a popular audience, they just want to see lots of movie clips and some cool tech. If I'm talking to a, a really academic audience, they want to know about the nature of responsible innovation and the movies are a little bit less important. Um, but with this audience, I get the impression that I, I really need to be talking both about the movies and about responsible innovation and how to think about this, especially from a, a cyber law perspective, as well as showing some movie clips. So this is what I thought I would do. Um, I thought I would start off just by giving some of the backstory of the, the book and my thinking here um, and explaining why as an academic, I wrote a book about sci-fi mu uh, movies, which is, it's a trade book. So it's written for a broad, um, broad uh, readership, but why I thought that this was important. Um, I then thought I'd, I'd go through um, three sets of movie clips just to give you a sense of how this juxtaposition between sci-fi movies and imagination and creativity and thinking differently about the future actually works. And then I'd wrap up saying a little bit more specifically about its relevance to cyber law. And hopefully that will leave us a little bit of time for Q&A at the end. So without further ado, why on earth did I write a book called Films from the Future? Um, remembering that um, I'm a fairly well-established um, expert in my field. Um, I write as an academic about technology and society in the future and responsible innovation. Um, I work with organizations like the World Economic Forum. And in the past, I've worked with several different organizations, um, including giving and testimony to congressional subcommittees. So I, I'm a pretty formal academic sort of person, not the sort of person you would expect to write a popular book about sci-fi movies. Um, and the reason I wrote it was fairly simple. Um, this really isn't a book about movies, but it's a book about thinking differently about technology, society, and the future. And it focuses on that uh, particular perspective for a number of reasons, but the biggest one of them is the more in my work I look at this relationship between the technologies we're developing and the future we're building, the more I have to conclude that we're at a tipping point in human society where how we've done things in the past really aren't translating that well to how we need to do things in the future if we're going to thrive. Um, and of course, I'm sure every generation says this and has been saying it for the last 10,000 years. Um, 
but I'm pretty sure that things are different now. Um, and I think they're different for three specific reasons. Um, the first is the degree of control we have over the world around us. We're now, for the first time in human history, able to work with what I actually refer in the book to base code. Um, and by that, I mean, we can redefine biology all the way down to the base code of DNA. We can actually begin to redesign and reconstruct biological systems from the basic code of atoms and molecules. We can do the same with materials through technologies like nanotechnology, where we can understand how the ways that atoms and molecules are put together change the properties and the nature of physical materials. And of course, in cyberspace, we've been building this for the last 30 or 40 years, but we're now at a unique point in human history where we can actually create from scratch fast landscapes in cyberspace, which allow us to do things that we just couldn't even imagine doing just a few years ago. So this idea of base coding, this idea that we can actually take the basic code that defines everything around us in biological space, in physical space, in cyberspace, and we can change it, we can write it, means that we can fundamentally change our future. And that to me is a really important tipping point. But it comes with some incredible levels of responsibility because if we're messing around with the base code, it's really easy to get things wrong. It's a little bit like taking your smartphone or your computer and saying, let's just tinker around with the machine code inside and see what happens. The chances are, unless you know exactly what you're doing, and very, very few people these days will, you're going to break the system. So then the question comes with us tinkering around with the base code of everything, are we in danger of breaking the system and creating a future which is immeasurably worse than the past? And if we are, how do you alert people to thinking about how we work with these new technologies in responsible ways? And the more I've thought about this over the years, the clearer it's become that we need to bring an awful amount of imagination and creativity to this. If we stick in our own little disciplines, in our own little areas of expertise, we will never have the perspective that we need in order to work out how to build a better future. And that's where I started talk, um, thinking about really unexpected and unusual ways of stimulating people to see their relationship with the future in very different ways. And it turns out that science fiction movies are really good at this. They're really good at it because they get under our skin, they get under our defenses, and they prompt us to think very, very differently about what the future might be like and how we can actually move towards a better future and away from more dystopian futures. So that was the genesis of um, the moviegoer's guide to the future and films from the future. And I want to give you that um, sort of perspective because it really underpins the nature of this book in particular in the course that I teach, that they're not about sci-fi movies, but they use sci-fi movies as a catalyst for thinking differently and deeply about how we build a better future. So to give you a sense of how that works, I thought I would move into three different movies um, because of course I also have to show movie clips um, in this, this lecture, otherwise I would never ever be invited back again. So let me just open my screen here and share this. Okay, oops, just a minute, stop the share because I need to make sure I've got video and sound on. And somebody shout out if this doesn't work, it should work, but I'm never quite clear. Okay, so I'm gonna um, choose three movies in the book. The first is 2002's Minority Report. Um, and this is in the book for multiple reasons, but one of the, the key reasons here it's here is that it allows a discussion of how we're beginning to use predictive or so-called predictive technologies to make decisions within society. Um, for those of you who either aren't familiar with the movie or haven't seen it for a while, this is a, a Steven Spielberg a movie with Tom Cruise as the main character, but it's built around this idea of precognition. So you have these three humans that have been genetically modified that have this unique ability to predict murders. Um, and within the movie, they're basically sort of subsumed. So they're in a subhuman um, condition, but they used to signal when a murder is going to occur. So then the, um, the forces associated with this unit, precog unit that they're part of can swoop in and prevent that murder from occurring. And they can sequester away the future criminals. So basically it's preemptive justice. You're taking the criminals out of the system before they've actually committed a crime. What is interesting about the movie is that the premise is utter 
another fantasy. We're never going to create humans that can see the future, but we are creating technologies that we claim can actually do that. And that's where it opens up the conversation. So I want to just play um, the first few minutes of the movie. I'm not going to play too much, but it gives you a sense of the excitement within this future society um, with which they were embracing this ability to predict where somebody was going to do something really bad and step in before they do. Let's just get this playing. Only the ones you give me. Okay, Jed, what's coming? Red ball, double homicide, one male, one female. Killers male, white, 40s. Agatha nailed the time frame at 8.04 a.m. The twins are a little fuzzy on that, so we'll need confirmation. It's still uncertain. Remote witnesses are plugged in. This will be case number 1108. Stand by. Time of murder, 8.04 a.m. That is 24 minutes, 13 seconds from now. This is a red one. Four score and seven years ago. He looked familiar. Who? A oh, man standing in the park across the street. I've seen him before. How can you even tell? You know how blind you are without your glasses. Where are your glasses? I must have left them up in the bedroom. You are running out of time. You know how blind I am. Show eight Howard Marks in the district, sorting by race and age. Under license registration. See if I can capture an address here. Running out of time. Oh. I was thinking maybe I'd play hockey, stay home today. Working too much tomorrow. Can you grab that? It's unclear. I got six licenses. Where do you want them? Over here, please. Send a DCPD blue and white. Set up a perimeter and tell on route. I show a match with Dwight Kingsley, 18th century architect. He did two dozen houses in DC. Time horizon, 10 minutes. 10 minutes! Oh. Look at this kid. And this one is on the left side of the man in the suit. Yes? So? This one is on the right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Merry go ahead. It's a park. Time horizon six minutes. Okay, so if you want to know what happens next, um, you're going to have to get the movie out and, and watch it. The point is, though, it's a movie that, first of all, celebrates the idea that in this society, they can predict when somebody is going to do something bad, in this case, murder someone, and they can put them away before they do. Great, until everything goes wrong. Total fantasy, apart from the fact of for two things. One, as human society, we've had a long history of using so-called technologies to predict when somebody might be bad or good and taking preemptive action with the bad people all the way through from phrenology and a number of other pseudo-scientific approaches all the way up to the modern day. Um, and this movie really prompts a conversation around how we navigate this, especially when we get into cyber technologies. Um, one of the things I would say when I was writing the chapter on Minority Report in the book is I, I started off looking at ideas around phrenology and eugenics and prediction of behaviors. And I thought that that's all in the past until I began to realize that especially with the advent of machine learning, there's been a whole new resurgence of people who seriously believe that they can predict what somebody might do and you can take action against it. And this is where the movie is really good at sparking conversations which might otherwise just fly by us. Just to emphasize this, this is um, an exercise that I mentioned in the book, um, uh, which relies on a tool developed by this company called um, Veris Prime. Um, and um, this is a company that claims to have a tool where if you answer a few questions, you can um, assess whether somebody is likely to be a white collar criminal or not. And they claim that this is great if you're employing people because you can work out who are the bad actors and bad apples before you actually employ them. And so you can avoid them. So of course, when I first heard about this a few years ago, I thought I'd take the test. Um, and these are my results, or we're going to get to my results in a second. So this is what the test gives you. It puts you on this um, continuum um, between a low score between north and 25, which puts you in a risk zone, um, up to a high um, score between 75 and 100, which puts you in a trust zone. This is the felon zone. If you end up with a score down here, according to Verus Prime, the chances are you are if not a criminal, you're going to have criminal tendencies. And of course, when I did the test, I came out way down here, 19%. You look at my profile, and this is what it said about me. It said, I'm the sort of person where I will regularly surrender to the temptation of short-term personal gains from cutting corners, breaking the rules, or bending the law, stretching the truth, telling people what they want to hear, even when you know it isn't true, failing to consider the consequences of one's actions, taking advantage of others, acting impulsively, and taking unjustified risks. Me down to a T. I hope not, actually. Um, the problem with this test 
is that for their benchmark, they used convicted white collar criminals. And what they failed to realize is that the tendencies that these white collar criminals show are remarkably similar to what you would expect in a self-motivated academic, which is why I scored so low, not because I hope I'm a criminal or have criminal tendencies, but because I think and act in a certain way. So it's, it's a way both of tying to the a movie in terms of this ability or this desire to predict what somebody might do and the dangers of relying on machines to do this. And we're actually finding that the more sophisticated we get with machine learning, the more people are being sucked into this idea that maybe we can predict what somebody's character is like, what somebody's nature is like, based on a whole bunch of data sets. And of course, that comes with many, many inbuilt biases. Um, in the last particular case, the inbuilt bias was the training set that they used from white collar criminals. So we're now seeing a number of cases where this is getting people into hot water. Um, this is um, one particular case that came to prominence back in 2018 with an app called Predictive. So this was an app that did what seemed to be a great thing. If you were a parent and looking for a babysitter, it basically scraped the social media feeds of that potential babysitter and gave them a score indicated whether they were likely to be a reliable or an unreliable babysitter. Um, so again, it was an app that used natural language processing and uh, machine learning to make value judgments on people, including judgments that are based on a set of internal biases in part associated with the training data. Uh, Washington Post uh, reported on this in November 23, 2018, um, and they were a little scathing about this, but what happened was that there was such a public backlash based on this article with people saying there's no way we want to be assessing whether somebody is going to be a potentially unreliable babysitter based on their social media profiles alone, that the market fell out for this particular company and they're no longer in business. So that's babysitters. We're seeing the same sort of thing in many different places. There are many different examples here, but one of the more prominent ones has been the internal bias within facial recognition systems. So this is going again back to 2016 now, um, quite some time ago, an article looking at machine bias where people are, are actually, even then, and they're still now, using these sort of technologies to predict who might be a criminal or might have criminal tendencies. And surprise, surprise, we discover that these systems are biased against people of color. Illustrating that even though we think the technology is right, it has very, very human biases built into it. And then of course, you've got companies like Palantir who um, are leading the pack in terms uh, predictive policing technologies, as well as a number of other technologies where they claim to be able to scrape data from many different sources to both identify crime hotspots and potentially even identify potential criminals. So I raise all this because when we're watching uh, Minority Report, we may think that the technology there is totally fantastical. And yet with the technologies we have to hand here, especially with machine learning, we're beginning to fall into exactly the same trap of assuming that we can use technology to predict what somebody might do and taking preemptive action. And then the question is, how far do we push this, especially in a legal um, a situation, but also in an ethical and moral framework? How far do we push this idea that we can use technology to predict what people might do and rob them of free will? So that's a movie that helps us explore this idea of what do we do when machines decide who is good and who is bad. Um, but there is another part of this where we can begin to extend this conversation around machines and ask, what do we do when machines alter what we can actually physically do as humans? And that takes us to the, the second movie that I want to look at, which is a Japanese anime movie called Ghost in the Shell. So this is, um, there are two versions of this movie. This is the, the anime version rather than the more recent um, Scarlett Johansson version, which was really not very good. And I need to give a, a bit of a, a segue into this. Um, it's a Japanese subtitle movie, um, ostensibly about this elite um, law enforcement group um, of cyborgs, people that were intimately um, interconnected with machines. Um, a lot of their body being replaced by machines, and it gave them a unique set of skills. But really, the movie is a philosophical examination of what it means to be human when you have parts of you that have been replaced not only by machines, but machines that are owned by someone else.
And the clip that I want to show you is a very self-reflexive piece where the, the main character here, Major Matoko, um, is grappling with what it means to be a person, what it means to be human when so much of your body has been replaced by machinery. And you'll see the clip starts um, with her having gone on a dive and just coming back up to the surface. The significance of this is, as a machine, she is heavy. She is putting herself in jeopardy by doing this. And part of her is trying to understand what it means to be human by putting herself at risk. Um, but I'll let the conversation play out here and you can see how this goes. So I find this movie fascinating because it really dives deep into what it really means to be human, even when we're replacing our biological selves with mechanical parts. Um, and of course, this is a debate that we're already having in society today, albeit at a, a far lower level. So there are many examples of where we've really been pushing the bounds of how we artificially enhance our bodies. Um, the example on the screen um, is a very well-known uh, one, the, the runner Oscar Pistorius with his cheetah legs. So this is a particularly interesting case, especially from a legal perspective. So Oscar Pistorius um, has, he lost his legs at an early uh, age um, below the, the knee. Um, but as a runner, he wants to keep on running. So he had these um, cheetah legs made for him, and a number of runners do have these. Um, but interestingly, when he was trying to compete in uh, an early Olympics before the 2012 Olympics, um, the question came up, do these give him an unfair advantage? Do they somehow enhance him? And the decision then, the legal decision was, yes, they do. And he was not allowed to um, compete. They actually reversed that decision in 2012. But it really put a fine point on this question of, are we somehow giving people an advantage with the types of technologies, types of machines that we're now able to incorporate into their bodies? And of course, it's not just limited to prosthetics. As technology advances, more and more people are interested in how they can augment themselves with technology. One of the simplest forms of this is RFID implants. And so over the last few years, there's been a growing interest, especially within DIY circles, of putting these little RFID chips, um, something like this, under the skin. Um, and using them to trigger a number of things. It basically gives them a unique identifier where they can remotely identify who they are or machinery um, computers can identify them and that can be used for various purposes. It's one thing though, to augment yourself and there are actually chipping parties that go on where people actually have these inserted. It's another thing if an employer decides that everybody has to have one of these chips. And now where are the legal and moral and ethical guidelines between what somebody else can impose on you in terms of the technology in your body? And remember this is an invasive technology versus what is a step too far. And we're beginning to see this sort of question expand out. So this has actually been going on for 20 odd years um, now. Some of you may recognize this is a picture of Steve Mann, who is somebody who's really experimented with augmentation. This is a, an eye set that he created for himself. Um, but the interesting story here is this is actually attached quite intimately to his head. Um, and the, the left eye that you can see on the screen, he has the ability to project different pieces of information into his eye there. But there was a case back in 1999 or the, the 1990s, where he was in a McDonald's in Paris and somebody decided they didn't like this tech. They thought it was too invasive. So they tried to rip this off his face. But because it's deeply embedded there, he actually caused physical harm to man while he was doing this. And it raises the question both of where is an individual's autonomy in terms of how they augment themselves? And what do we do when that begins to impact on other people? Then the question becomes even more complex when we're looking at deeply and intimately embedded devices, as we're increasingly being um, seeing in the medical arena. So take something like this, an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. Um, so a device that's designed to monitor your heart and, and give it a jump start if it falters or stops. What is interesting about these devices, and increasingly they're wireless devices, um, is that you don't actually own the device, if you have one, and you don't own the data. Which means that now you have a device in you that your life depends on, that somebody else owns. If you need an upgrade, somebody else has got to authorize that, you've got to pay for it. And that raises the, exactly the same question as was raised in Ghost in the Shell. The more of your body that's replaced by other parts, 
how much of you is owned by yourself versus somebody else? This is a really interesting and convoluted and really challenging legal landscape that we're just on the cusp of beginning to explore. And then, of course, you've got technologies like Elon Musk's Neuralink. Um, so if, we th if you think that defibrillators are complex in terms of who owns them, who owns the data, imagine what happens when you have a neural implant with 32,000 connections where you can use that to interface wirelessly with your phone and the internet. But who owns that? If it goes wrong, who is responsible for fixing it? If it needs a software update, who is responsible for that? If you don't want to pay for that software update, what are the consequences to you? Or if you want that particular device extracted, where are the legal ramifications for how that plays out? And again, I feel we're just on the cusp of having to make these really complex decisions between in this, this space between us, the humans, the machinery we put into our body and the cyber systems that they intersect with. So that's a little bit of an exploration of what happens when machines alter what we can do. The final section that I want to look at here is asking what happens when we go several steps further and we have machines that can manipulate who we are. So this gets into the realm of artificial intelligence. And for this final segment, I want to draw on the, the movie Ex Machina. Um, this is a very rich movie, and we could go multiple ways here, but I want to look at it from one specific example. So to give you the, the backstory of this uh, movie, um, it's really driven by a mega entrepreneur, incredibly bright person that's decided that they want to sequester themselves away in this private estate and create the best artificial intelligence. And they brought along one of their employees to supposedly test this AI. Um, it's the, the robot Ava that you see on the screen here to see how effective an AI she is. And as the story unfolds, you realize there are nuances and complexities here. So I want to show you two or three clips. Um, and I'm going to frame them in a very specific way. So the first clip is this introduction between the, the two main characters, where you begin to get a sense of what this story might be about. Okay, so this sounds like a fairly simple story of somebody creating an artificial intelligence that is so smart it's indistingu indistinguishable from a human. But there is a really interesting story about enlightenment going on through this um, movie that reflects a lot of what we think about enlightenment through the allegory of Plato's cave. So just to refresh you on the um, allegory of Plato's cave, this is very quickly how it goes. Imagine you have some prisoners who are locked up in a cave. They have their backs to a wall and they're chained to that wall and all they can see is the wall opposite them in front of them. On that wall, there are shadows that are cast. Those shadows are cast from puppets that are behind them. So these people can't see the puppets. They've no idea what a puppet is. All they can see is on the wall. That is their sole reality. But what they think of as reality is just shadows cast by these puppets and a fire. And then all of this is in a cave. But imagine that these prisoners are freed of their shackles and they climb up, begin to climb up out of this cave and they realize that what they thought of as reality is in fact just a bunch of puppets where their shadows are being cast. That's the first level of enlightenment where they realize what they thought of as reality isn't. Now imagine that they come out of the cave and realize even the puppets aren't reality, but rather the puppets are just a shadow of a further reality outside the cave. So this process, according to Plato, is the process of enlightenment. And he used to tell this story to justify the existence of philosophers, saying philosophers are the people that have climbed out of the cave and then come back to enlighten the others that are chained within the cave to help them understand that what they think of as reality is just a mere shadow of reality. And this is a theme that goes through this movie, Ex Machina. But you begin to see it evolve in really quite different ways to how Plato was thinking about it. So with the next clip, we We've gone through a process where Caleb has started testing Ava, the AI, to see how human she is. And in this particular interview here, everything changes. And we suddenly realize that Caleb, who thought he was the interrogator, now begins to be the manipulator with the AI actually manipulating him. So just watch how this plays out, where the interrogator becomes interrogated and manipulated. Um, what happens next is that Ava works out how she can use Caleb to escape from this cave that she's been sequestered inside. So we can see, and I'm skipping a little forward here, how this... 
Okay, so I'm going to skip ahead. But you begin to see this story emerging of this artificial general intelligence beginning to realize that what they thought of as reality is just a small, shadowy reflection of reality. She's going through an enlightenment. So she's both in a physical cave, but she's also in a cognitive mental cave that she's beginning to come out of. And just to reinforce that, I just want to show you the final scenes in the movie. So at this point, Ava has effectively either killed or sequestered away her human captors. And she's beginning to experience what it means to come into true enlightenment as she leaves this both very real and very metaphorical. So the movie ends up very provocatively with that image of the shadows and it forces us to ask what if in this new cyber world we're creating we or the reality we see is simply shadows being cast on the wall of our minds. And it's actually going to be the machines that can see the greater reality beyond that. The machines become enlightened to our unenlightened. And as they do, what are they going to do? If the enlightened are artificial intelligence, are they going to come back and enlighten us? Or are they going to use that to manipulate and control us? So to wrap up, let me just take that off sharing. There we go. Hopefully that gives you a, a sense of how both the course I teach, um, the book um, and the work that I do uses science fiction movies as a way of not only telling different stories about our relationship with um, technology and society in the future, but how we can use these stories to see things in different ways and more productive ways as we work out how to get to the next step in building a positive future. Um, so just to really quickly wrap this up in um, the, the context of cyber law before we open it up to questions. Why is this relevant to cyber law? Well, it's deeply relevant for a couple of reasons. One, this realm of cyber that we're creating is a game changer. It touches on everything we do. If we think about base code, where I started with, whether you're looking at physical base code or biological base code, both of those are connected to what we do in cyberspace. We can control everything with our future in cyber. But then secondly, if you're thinking about the legal aspects, how can you develop the legal frameworks and the legal know-how and the legal actions and processes to navigate this world of cyber if you don't have this holistic understanding of how the world of cyber works and how it connects with everything else that's, that's going on, especially as the future we're building is so markedly different from the past. So this to me is where it's so important that we use creative impetuses and creative factors, including science fiction movies to pull us out of conventional thinking where we just think that the domain we're in is the domain that is all that's necessary and to begin to think about how we see beyond the bounds of those ruts of those domains and understand the world that we're beginning to inhabit in a far more holistic way so we can make decisions which truly do help us build a better more just more equitable more vibrant future and at that point as always being an academic